Okay, if you remember the activity in which um, you had to reach in and draw out as a group um, a sample of around 40, and some groups did around 30 chips from a bag of chips which you had no idea um, the number, total number of chips, nor in this case the number of white chips in there, and you um, had to draw out as a group, again, um, for 30 or 40 chips. Um, let's say, for example, that I drew out 40 chips, my group did, and I got found 17 white chips. So my p hat there would be 17 divided by 40, 0.425. Um, so let's create a confidence rule, just like we did in class, um, to predict what the total population of white chips were in the whole bag, even though we only saw 30 or 40 chips, depending on what our group did. So some of the conditions that you need to be aware of at all times when you do confidence intervals is you got to make sure the sample size is large enough so that both the number of successes which we define as n times p and the number of failures which is n times 1 minus p has to be at least 10. As long as that happens then our sampling distribution is approximately normal. Um, we have to show that the mean, we're going to use the mean of the sampling distribution of p hat um, as an approximation for p. So the standard deviation then was using the formula for categorical data, p times 1 minus p divided by n, square root the whole thing. Um, so obviously um, we don't know what p is, um, which is the population, the proportion for the whole population, so we use p hat as an, uh, a way to estimate what p is. So these are the three conditions for estimating p using a confidence interval. First of all, it does have to be random, and if you remember, um, everyone took out a random sample, mixed up the bag before we passed it on to the next group to make sure the next group had a, a simple random sample of 40 chips. Um, again, to check for normality, we got to make sure both the number of successes and the number of failures was at least 10. And in my example here, if I drew 17 out of 40 chips, then that means 17 were white, and that means 23 were non-white. And so since both those numbers are at least 10, I meet the conditions for being normal. Independent. Um, this is what we call, what I call the rule of 10. We have to show that the sample size times 10, we have to show that the population is bigger than that number. And remember, you didn't know that when you were doing your sampling, but I did tell you later on that the sample size, or the uh, sample size being 40, that the number of chips was actually 500, which is fine because then if you take your sample size 40 and multiply by 10, 400, our population was bigger than that. So that means that we can um, verify the independence. Since all three conditions are met, we can then therefore construct a confidence interval and feel confident in our answer. Okay? So once again, the general formula for our A confidence interval is statistic plus or minus critical value times the standard deviation of our statistic. And since we don't know what P is, we're going to use P hat as a replacement for P in our um, standard deviation formula. Um, when we do that, we call this the standard error. Okay, since we acknowledge the fact that we're not actually using p and we're using p hat as an estimate, um, we call this the standard error. And so this is a notation that you need to be aware of that they sometimes use and they ask you what is the standard error. And that's basically the standard deviation where you use your um, statistic as a replacement for the parameter. Okay, so uh, again, when we use the standard deviation of the statistic um, and it's estimated from our data, we call this the standard error of the statistics. You need to include this on your notes for this chapter. So to find the critical value, which is the key component of um, any confidence interval, we need to use, um, we can use the 6895.99.7 rule and find the critical value. Um, but as we've been learning in class, you can use table A in the back where, if, for example, 95% confidence rule, you realize at least 5% on the two tails together, so each tail is 2.5%. So since we want to use the z-score table, which shows um, the confidence interval plus one of the tails, we would look for 97.5% in table A. I also showed in class that you can use table C in the back of the book and look at the bottom row, and you can find your confidence, the critical value for each confidence interval real quickly and easily by looking at the z-star row at the bottom of the table. And I think most of you found that that was much easier to do than having to think about what percentage to look at in table A. So I encourage you to use table C whenever you need to use a table to determine the critical value of any confidence interval.